Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for coming tonight and sharing your evening with me. You know, thanks Canandaigua Lake Watershed Association for putting this together and FLCC for hosting this. You know, I think this will be a good opportunity to share some of my knowledge and some really interesting facts about the history of the area, how it's, you know, wildlife has changed over time and what some of the current, you know, you know, challenges are to keep wildlife and habitats healthy. So again, I'm Mike Palermo with DEC. I've been doing this uh, about 11 years with DEC as a wildlife biologist. And that primary focus of forest habitat management on, on wildlife management areas has been a really great learning experience to um, you know, try to make things better, to assess you know, the condition of things that not everything is, is as pretty and beautiful as you, you know, think it might be just because it's green. And we've got a lot of issues and a lot of it has stemmed from our history and there's a lot of ways for us to move forward and make things better. So it's really great when I can come out to places like this and share that with everybody else. But so the topic, history of wildlife, in Canandaigua, he mentioned, so two centuries of change is really the focus of what I'm going to describe the history of tonight and then how that affected wildlife populations. So this is just an outline of where I'm going to go. The majority of it is this, this fun kind of history lesson to discuss what those habitat changes looked like and then to really relate that to the wildlife populations uh, of our area. Uh, you know, have they done well? Have they done poorly? and what might they do in the future. And then I'll close with this other concept of, of our current issues and the threats to our habitat that we have right now. Not everything is you know, on a good path and, and there's a lot that need, is needed to be done still. And so I'll talk about what those threats are and what everybody hopefully can do, that we can all have some impact. So this is our focus area, the Canandaigua Lake watershed and it's about 109,000 acres. I looked that up, I had to check on that. So it's a sizable area. And you know, there's some diversity when you look at the more southern area part of this. It's a lot of terrain, steep slopes, very hilly, you know, big valleys down at that end. And then you get to the northern half, it's more gentle, much more gradual. And that terrain has influenced the history and how it has been used by people over time and that has directly influenced what it looks like today. So this overlay is the cover types of our area. It's data put together by the US Geological Survey, the National Land Cover Data Set from 2019. So it's pretty up to date. And you know everything that's green is forest. And so a lot of it's forest here. And of the watershed, really that southern Half of it is extremely forested, so it's a lot of really great habitat for wildlife associated with forests. And then you get to the northern part of the watershed, you get a lot more of the yellow and the browns, and that's agricultural landscapes. So the brown is mostly cultivated crops, the yellow is more pasture, hay, and things like that. And it coincides with that terrain difference, right? The more flatter, flatter gentler terrain to the north is you know, cleared land used for agriculture, and then the red at the top, a little bit of red down below, that's village of Naples, up there's the city of Canandaigua. So just briefly to touch on the deeper history, to show our timeline of events here, 21,000 years ago, where we're standing, all this, we were a mile and a half under ice, right? This whole area, was, it was the ice age, it was glaciated, that was really the maximum at 21,000 years ago, and then it started to recede. And so roughly about 13,000 years ago, most of New York was ice free and then slowly started to change to look like what it looks today. This imagery here is to show how plant life moved after the ice receded and temperatures warmed, different plants could then move northward. And there's really great research out there that shows how plants and what species moved uh, looking at pollen records and sediment. And so there's a lot of cool diagrams like this. This is just showing oaks of all the different species and where they moved. So on this left side, it's 18,000 years ago. And then far right side, it's the present day. And so somewhere about, my laser was really tiny before. Yeah, it's still tiny. You're not gonna see that red dot at all. Around 6,000 years ago is about when we got to a similar condition that we have now with a lot of the species already being here. So the, the forests that we're gonna discuss and the habitats were you know, pretty well represented 6,000 years ago. So that's a long time for that to be present here and then to be significantly changed. 
thereafter, which is what we're really going to get into now. So 13,000 years ago, right, ice free. And, you know, about during that entire time, 13,000 years, there have been native peoples in the area, uh, you know, indigenous tribes, and they had a relationship with the land. They manipulated it, managed it, absolutely. Uh, but I'm not going to get into much discussion about that tonight. That could be its own topic. Where we're really focusing on is when settlement happened in the area. So the big wave of European settlement, and it really began in the late 1700s. And at that time, our records, you know, a lot of the old uh, documents that you can find, New York was probably about 80 to 90% forested. So extremely forested. That was, that was what we had. And a lot of it probably looked like this, you know, uh, you know pretty dense, uh, extensive forest, a lot of accumulated debris, big trees that would just die and fall. Um, a lot of it was late successional forest, which is uh, a term we call for species that develop over time. They grow in shade, they live a long time. There's records that show what type of species of trees were in different areas around settlement. And a lot of this part of New York, the northern part of the watershed, had a lot of beech, had a lot of sugar maple, there was some hemlock. Further south, in the more hilly parts of the watershed, there was a lot of oak and a lot of chestnut. Um, but there was a lot of diversity too, that the entire forest wasn't just giant trees like this. There absolutely were big trees, but you know, millennia, 6,000 years, hundreds of years of, of turnover, disturbances happening, trees dying, trees, you know, starting new. There was a lot of diversity. There was young trees, giant trees, uh, just, just patches that got, you know, wiped out by storms, floods that regrew, and then some kind of sheltered areas where there were giant trees like this. But it wasn't just an extensive, like, redwood grove across all of New York. There was a lot of diversity to it. And a lot of the watershed, for, forests in the Canada Way watershed, definitely looked a lot like this. There were a lot more wooded swamps back then. In the northern part of the watershed, where it's much more gentle terrain, a lot of it's agriculture now, you can still see that there's little pockets of wetlands here and there. They used to be a lot more extensive, and they were definitely forested like a lot of them are today, but a lot of these have been drained and cleared for agriculture. So there was this you know, combination of these hilltops, extensive forest, and also a lot of swampy wet forest. The wildlife of that time, pretty much what you would probably assume. We really had most of them. This image is pretty cool. This photo I took, it's from the Coming Nature Center, uh, which is just barely out of the watershed, but close enough. They have this display of some of the species from you know, the, the original forest here. And there's wolves, we absolutely had them. Mountain lions, elk, bobcat, we had all of these. Um, moose is there, which moose probably wandered through this part of the state. But around that time, most of the records are showing moose were still a more northern species up in the Adirondacks, probably a little bit more in like the closer to Lake Ontario, but getting down into the hills, there were less moose. But some of the other ones I have listed here, plenty of black bear, loads of deer, there were turkey, lots of beaver, fisher. So I'm gonna highlight in, you know, details about each of these in a little while. But so the timeline, settlement, really began after the Revolutionary War. So that ended 1783, and town of Canandaigua was settled in 1789, and shortly thereafter, 1792, is some of the first records of a sawmill down in West River, so that's down near Naples. So things really started to progress quickly that, and the land started to be changed. The image over there is a nice starting point because it shows, um, you know, homestead, early settlers, clearing some trees, building what they need, using the fuel they needed, and it quickly, you know, just increased logging, building communities, exporting some of these logs for, you know, other needs elsewhere. Um, and then over the decades, that dramatically increased to, to widespread land clearing. So all these wide open, you know, fieldy areas that we have today, you know, this is when a lot of those became, they, they stopped being forests and they became open land. So a lot of this was logged. Uh, a lot of it was put to good use, sure. You know, they built things, they sent things away, but a lot of it got burned and they ripped out a bunch of stumps. I just think this is a cool photo to show, you know, the horsepower and the, you know, the way they had to build things to really haul these out of the ground. Uh, but so, you know, over that progression of 1792 through the mid 1800s, a lot of things happened and it happened pretty quickly. So the peak of that was around 1880. 
know, the peak of our land clearing. So New York State went from about 80 to 90 percent forest way down to 25 percent. So it's a huge, huge decrease and that obviously has dramatic um, implications for wildlife and populations and so we'll get to that. But a lot of that was, you know, fueled by technological changes that really helped make everything more efficient. Logging and clearing harder to reach areas became simpler. Um, so at that peak, even though a lot of the land was already transformed into, you know, cleared fields for agriculture, there was still a lot of logging going on. And some of the photos really show it that changes in, in mills and their saws, efficiencies and abilities, increased logging, uh, ability to have, you know, assistance with rail and pulling things out of there was really, really, you know, helpful to continue and, and increase logging. And this is cool because it shows hemlock trees where the bark is being peeled off because the bark was very important for the tanning process for leather. So no species was really spared. Everything had a point in time where it was the target and, and it had a function in the economy and they went after just about everything. Um, and, and, you know, a couple other really neat things is thinking about what wood was used for and why so much of it was, was harvested and, and taken off the landscape was charcoal. You could take any sort of wood basically and turn it into charcoal and charcoal was incredibly important for making steel and iron before we had regular coal, right? So that was a huge important industrial use. You could make wood alcohol out of just wood, there's some process, and that was used for you know, industrial chemical processes, so important stuff. So until the 1920s when the petrochemical industry really got underway and people started using you know, real coal and gas and oil instead, wood was what everyone depended upon. So it, it was absolutely utilized and widespread, but that all changed. After the Civil War, you know, a lot of things shifted that caused a lot of that land that was cleared to be abandoned. So you know, a lot of it was that the land wasn't productive. A lot of it was on the hilltops. It just had poor soil, it was thin soil. Uh, some of it was that we just didn't know how to conserve soil, right? So they may have had really great crops for 10, 20 years and then it all went downhill because the soil went away. And a lot of it was that people could move out west. You know, after the Civil War, railroads moving to the west, easier to get to places that had more fertile soil, Wisconsin, Iowa, places like that. So a lot of people uh, abandoned their farms here and like that top photo over there, trees and shrubs started to grow in on their own. And that all really accelerated that reforestation in the 1930s. So the creation of the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, that began in 1933. It lasted for nine years and three million people planted three and a half billion trees. So it's pretty significant. So a dramatic amount of change that if that program didn't exist, who knows what our landscape would look like right now. Uh, but so by the 1940s, a lot of the southern tier, so probably a lot of the southern part of this watershed was forested again. And so during that time frame, the late 1800s through that 1930s, a lot of that reforestation was happening at the same time that logging was still happening. Some of those harder to reach places, but a lot of what was logged earlier was being logged again, right? It was the second growth, trees were big enough again. So a lot of that was still happening and habitats were still being altered. This just summarizes it, captures this big change that we saw here. Um, 1600 is on the left and then the big dip is around 1880, right? Matches up and then things started to go back up as places were abandoned and trees were planted. And then that other chart over there is really the, a very similar image, but it's showing farmland. Farmland peaks around 1880 and then slowly declines. So farmland goes down, forest goes up, you know, that direct relationship. We totally cleared the land, but then it reforested to an extent. And where we are today is that current forest in New York State is 63% of the state. So we went from 80 to 90% down to 25% back in 1880 to 63%, which we reached about like 1994 was kind of, and it's been kind of steady since then. We don't expect it to go up a whole lot because even though you see farmland and some fields being abandoned today, you know, it's kind of being replaced by some development and that. So it's kind of steady. But 18.7 million acres of forest in New York, habitat for wildlife, it's not bad. This is what a lot of our forests look like that you'll see out here. You know, the average is probably 90 to 120 years old for some of the, the nicer mature forests. A lot of it's oak, a lot of it's hickory, sugar maple, 
We also have a lot of forest that looks like this, right? Our, our hemlocks along the gorges on Canandaigua Lake, really important, you know, really unique forest type. We also have a lot of this. So it's, it's a, a younger forest, maybe eight to 12 inch diameter trees. A lot of these were abandoned from fields back just 30 to 50 years ago. And they happen to have a very different species composition than fields that were abandoned in you know, 1880, dramatically different. These are mostly ash, aspen, walnut, and red maple. We got plenty of that around in the watershed. And then loads of these, these conifer plantation. Uh, which is a lot of what the CCC had planted. You know, red pine, Norway spruce were a lot of their go-tos and we have plenty of these. So I like to show this image so that when you're out in the forest, you know, whether you're on public land or you own your own forest and you, you know, want to kind of interpret the history of it and what, you know, may have happened to it, if you see some of these features, you can really kind of read it and, and figure out what may have happened. So if you see rock walls out in the woods, you know, it most likely, at least one side of it, if not both sides, were you know, cleared and they tried to grow something on it at some point in time. You know, same with rock piles, you know, as they're trying to clear land and cultivate it and grow stuff, the rocks had to go somewhere. And then these old stump fences are pretty cool. You know, I've seen all these in different forests in our general area, but to find these stump, stump fences in the middle of the woods was definitely pretty bizarre. And so I think a lot of time they're they're made out of chestnut, which is really rot resistant. So a hundred, hundred year old stump is still out there. So that, that lays out, you know, the context of what changed in the habitat and wildlife needs habitat. So it, it, you know, that, that foundation for what could live here was dependent on what was available for them for their habitat. But a lot of other things influenced them. So the next bit is how humans had a more direct role in it, right? Through, um, unregulated, exploitative hunting and trapping, that had a huge impact. So it was the, the physical harvest of, of animals and the loss of their habitat that really drove a lot of them down. And so this is just a history of what it was like and how um, we've addressed that and corrected the problem of this, you know, just unsustainable harvest of, of different wildlife. So in the early days, there were no rules, right? People were settlers, they took what they needed. And, and, you know, sometimes that turned out to be too much. In 1788, there was actually a statewide law, since most laws were le uh, local, there was actually a statewide one that closed the deer hunting season during the breeding season. So that was at least something, you know, understanding biology and putting that into the rules, which is really important. But enforcement was really hard. All these rules mean nothing if there's no one actually catching people and holding them accountable. So in 1880, the first fish and game protectors were created and employed by New York State. So that's like the game wardens, today's DEC's environmental conservation officers. They started in 1880 and actually even a few years before state troopers were hired. In 1892, uh, because of having some ability with law enforcement, more laws were created. Um, they were made even better in 1895 when the creation of this agency here, the Fisheries, Game and Forest Commission uh, was, was created, which then evolved and became who I work for now, the Department of Environmental Conservation. So in 1926, it became the Conservation Department, and in 1970, it became DEC when that Natural Resources Agency that dealt with wildlife, fish, and forestry combined with our environmental quality programs like air quality, water quality, um, pesticide regulations, all sorts of stuff. So now we have one complete agency. But back in history. So 1897, uh, moving down the path of, of this agency really helping to fix some problems, New York outlawed unsportsmanlike methods, you know, a variety of them, but really thinking what are we doing and how is it harming wildlife versus, you know, sustenance and, and recreation. Um, so trying to correct some of those issues. But one of the big fixes is this law called the, the Lacey Act from 1900. So part of the issue was this unregulated market hunting. So people were hunting deer, turkey, whatever, to just ship them off somewhere else for someone else to utilize, and they made money off of it. The Lacey Act basically outlawed market hunting because you could no longer um, hunt something and then sell it in another state. So that market collapsed. And that was really important because that's what we really needed to, to reduce the incentive for people to um, disobey the rules and over harvest. And another amazing thing happened for wildlife's sake in 1937, the passage of this 
Pittman-Robertson Wildlife Restoration Act. So that was uh, enacted with the you know, support of, of sportsmen, legislators, conservationists all together, and it's a tax on firearm sale and ammunition sales, 11%, and all that goes into a fund that the federal government then gives out to the states each year, distributes for hunter education programs, wildlife research, you know, special habitat management projects. So a lot of the projects I do, paid by this. You know, a lot of the state land, the wildlife management areas that you might go and hike or hunt, a lot of the projects we do, paid for by this. It's an amazing thing that really helped fund conservation across the board. Um, and the really cool thing about it is that it funded research that could inform us about the biology, the behavior, the habitats of wildlife to know what do they need, where are they, what, what's the problem, and, and trying to create solutions and actually testing them so that these laws intending to protect wildlife was actually based on science and it can be evolving over time. Science informs it so that we're always making the right choices to make things sustainable. So I'm gonna go now kind of a, a count um, individual species at a time for a little bit to kind of highlight some of the wild swings that these species really had. Some of them really, you know, went from a million to nothing. So beavers are a good one to start with because even before that European settlement happened and the dramatic landscape change happened, there was the fur trade. And people were, you know, coming through here and other places around the area, harvesting beaver to send away because of their, you know, valuable pelt. Beaver felt hats was a really big deal in the 17 and 1800s. People loved it. And, and that led to, you know, dramatic decline in beavers. And then around 1800, just improvements in technology and the traps and baits and methods, that that was just a, another huge hit and making it easier and more successful for people to take them. 1860, there were only 50 beavers left in New York State, and they were all up in a remote part of the Adirondacks. 1895, one colony left, and so that's when that agency, right, the conservation agency was created, 1895, that they made this law no more killing beavers at all throughout the state. Something's really wrong here, and we've got to, you know, halt it all and figure it out. So after they stopped harvest, numbers started to rebound, and then a reintroduction program began in 1900, taking beavers from that holdout and putting them in other places of the state. Hugely successful. So that by 1915, we had 15,000 beavers in New York. That's increased dramatically since then. They've been able to open up, you know, a sustainable season for trapping. Now there's probably, I don't know the exact numbers, but there's probably a million beavers in New York State right now, and we have conflicts with them now, right? People have issues with them flooding their property, flooding roads, damaging their trees, so we even sometimes issue permits for people to deal with nuisance issues. So beaver have made a wonderful comeback, fortunately. White-tailed deer. So when people started settling the areas, uh, we had plenty of white-tailed deer. Uh, numbers were very locally dependent on what the habitat looked like and whether there was you know, adequate food for them. So uh, where the forest had had a disturbance and there was a bunch of young trees, lots of deer food, there were plenty of deer. But in the you know, expansive, older, bigger tree forest, there were probably less deer. As settlement began in the early 1800s, the number of deer actually went up because the habitat got better for them because people started to do some logging that encouraged some trees to grow and then they started growing some crops. So there was an increase in deer food so that the records show that in the early 1800s there was problems like we have today with deer damage on crops and people having a hard time growing food. That didn't last long. Mid 1800s, just complete collapse of the deer population. And that coincided with that really, you know, uh, quick, an extensive land clearing event where it didn't, you know, it wasn't just setting up homesteads, it was clearing land to grow crops, forest was gone, and it was turned into really intensive farming. You know, not, not farming that had, um, you know, some food here, some cover there, it was just all crops and not enough forest. So it wasn't enough to even support deer. And on top of that was the market hunting, right? So 1895, legal protections were put in place that helped the deer slowly grow, but this depiction here really shows it that maybe the laser will help up here now. 
So we got the Adirondacks up here, our little hash mark there. This is where deer managed to still remain. Um, and then down here, laser disappeared, so never mind that. But down at the, the Adirondacks and the Catskills is where there was a little bit of deer holding out. The rest is in Pennsylvania, Vermont up there. It wasn't until, you know, you look here probably about 1930 that says that deer came back to this area. So mid 1800s till about 1930, that's about 80 years. That's, you know, two generations of people or whatever that lived in Canandaigua and they didn't see any deer. That's insane. So luckily we're in a different place than they were. We kind of have too many deer and I'm going to talk about that in a little while, but I'd rather see this than no deer. Black bear, very similar history. Um, you know, by that late 1800s, a lot of them had been driven out. You know, people were afraid of bears. The bear skins had some value. Uh, people ate bear. People still do. Uh, so they were really driven to just the, the more inaccessible mountainous areas of the state. And there was a bounty, you know, an actual, you got money if you could prove that you killed a bear. 1903, legal protections began. And then we have a, a similar uh, depiction here to show how bear were restricted to the darker shaded areas. So Adirondacks, Catskills, and over here the kind of Allegheny Highlands area. And this, this drawing there, this chart is 1950. So in 1950, they were in those dark areas reliably and in the gray area just occasionally being transient. So that does not include our area here. So there were no bears in Canandaigua in 1950. And then this other one shows the 2007 range. And that gray is showing where they are, you know, reasonably reliably. They finally made it to the Canandaigua area. So, you know, that's 1950 to 2007. Mm, we're, we're, we're looking at a long time, you know, 60 plus years, no bears in the area either. Now they're quite regular. You know, I mean, if you're down hiking in, you know, Stid Hill or High Tour, you see a bear, no one's going to be surprised. You know, you have a bird feeder in your backyard and a bear comes and destroys it, no one's gonna be surprised. Keep your bird feeders down in the summertime, they don't need the food. Um, but so, yeah, it's just wild and crazy. And now they'll, they'll go up beyond this. You know, you'll see bears, city of Canandaigua occasionally wandering through. They go up to Lake Ontario. It's mostly young males just trying to figure out where they wanna live until they figure out what the best habitat is. And they usually wind up going back south where there's more food, more extensive forest for them. Wild turkey. Very similar story. So 1840s, they were extirpated or reduced to extremely low levels. So extirpated means gone from New York State. And the main reason is the same as the rest, right? Loss of forest, farming was too intense that it didn't support them, right? You see turkey nowadays near farms, you'd think maybe they could survive. It was just too, too extensive without um, the habitat they need throughout their life stages. And hunting, they were pretty easy to harvest and a great food source. So the late 1940s, there were, so there were no turkeys in New York State, 1840. In the late 1940s, finally some made their way from Pennsylvania into southwestern New York, like the Allegheny area. So 100 years with no turkeys in New York State, absolutely mind-blowing. In 1952, the state began a program to try and um, propagate turkeys. And they had a farm, and they raised them, and they released them and it didn't work out so well. They were just too tame. They couldn't figure out how to survive to eat and they just kept getting eaten by predators because they just didn't even know how to hide. So that was kind of a failure. But then in 1959, they decided, well, maybe we better deal, you know, forget about the farm raised turkeys and move to the wild ones. So the ones that made their way into Southwestern New York, they trapped some of them, moved them elsewhere, let them go, huge success. So they did that for 35 years DEC moved 1,400 turkeys, uh, which is amazing and it's great that it was a success. But from this, you know, 35 years, so that means back in like 1990, they were still moving turkeys around. Turkeys were not widespread even just 30 years ago, which I didn't know that. I thought it was pretty wild because they're everywhere now. Bobcats, so it's a very similar story. You know, all of these, they follow that same trend. Forest was removed, market hunting, population collapse. Uh, so it's gonna be very similar to the rest of the species that I'm gonna talk about, but, so bobcat, even as late as 1970, were really just restricted to some of those more remote wild areas like the Adirondacks, Catskills, Taconic, which is like lower Hudson where it's really hilly. 
Um, but around 1980, that did increase pretty significantly. And so now, yeah, absolutely. We've got Bobcat around here. You know, if you see a Bobcat, that's, that's not too surprising. But we're just now doing research to try and get a better idea of just how extensive, you know, where, where are they exactly and in what abundance. So we're setting up, you know, game cameras with bait to really try and figure out, okay, our Bobcat in these areas. And then next summer we might actually trap some and put GPS transmitters on them to see where they're going, what habitats they're using, and we'll have a better idea of, of what habitat is best for them. Likewise with the fisher. So a lot of people refer to the fisher as the fisher cat. It's not a cat at all actually. It's a member of the weasel family and it's the second largest weasel in New York State. Um, River otter being the number one uh, in the weasel family. So fisher, it was in our area, it's pretty widespread throughout New York State historically, but never in a lot of abundance. And that's just the, the nature of the animal and, and its biology that it's you know, not congregating in a lot of numbers usually. It's got pretty large territories. But so again, by the 19, early 1900s, just in the Adirondacks, you know, its fur was pretty valuable. So that was another driving force for it and the, and the market trapping. Uh, and the forest loss. So it took this one a long time to recover because fish are like more extensive tracts of forest that have some age to them. You know, that, that really had some time to develop the right structure uh, and the right prey bases that they're be able, gonna be able to survive there. So 1936, they closed the trapping season because there you know, weren't really any to be found in a lot of places and it wasn't sustainable to continue harvest. In the 70s and 80s, they took some of those fisher from the Adirondacks, released them in the Catskills. And then in 94, they took some and released them into Pennsylvania. So the fisher that we have here in the Canandaigua area now, absolutely, we've, we've got them. You know, if you've seen them, that's awesome. They actually migrated up from Pennsylvania to our area here and not like from the Adirondacks to us here. Uh, so that's, that's pretty exciting. We did a study with fisher uh, for the past several years and it fi finished up a couple years ago so that we have a much better understanding of, of where they are um, and what numbers and how that can influence you know, the, the regulations that apply to Fisher. Elk. So I'm transitioning now to some of the species that are no longer here, right? So it's not as happy of an ending. But we absolutely had elk. Uh, they were pretty widespread. Uh, great species that, you know, easy to hunt. Uh, a lot of food in one animal, so it didn't take long before they were depleted. So early 1800s, uh, most of the elk were gone, and the last recorded elk in New York State was in 1847. 1880, the eastern elk subspecies was declared extinct. So that's the whole eastern U.S. There was, you know, pretty um, specific subspecies of elk there, just gone, no more. Uh, so that's, you know, a tragedy. In 1913, you know, nearby in Pennsylvania, you probably know there's some elk down there. A reintroduction effort happened in Pennsylvania where they took some elk from Yellowstone area and released them in Pennsylvania. And they've actually had quite a bit of success that they've got a good number of them. It's a great tourism destination right now, uh, but they do intentionally manage them to not grow beyond a certain number and to keep them kind of contained in a certain area. So they're most likely not gonna wander off into New York state. There were some reintroduction attempts in New York around that same time in the early 1900s, but unfortunately none of them actually were successful. It was in the Adirondacks. You know, there was a number of releases. There was some temporary success where they even did get up to, you know, two, 300 individuals, but different disease, and poaching problems, the population just started to slide and continue to decline and, and it just didn't work and it was never tried again. So, you know, you're, you're asking yourself, well, what's next? So it's unlikely that elk will be intentionally reintroduced to New York State. And a number of the reasons are there's some opposition, um, you know, from the public. And they've got some decent reasons, you know. Do we want another large animal that could become another, you know, car collision risk and, and people's health for that? Maybe. Uh, crop damage, right? We already have a lot of issues with deer damaging crops and that being really hard for folks to you know, make a livelihood. Um, and another issue is, you know, some of the, the research has looked at the, you know, some of the best elk habitat would be up in the Adirondacks. We have approximately 500 moose in the Adirondacks right now, which is a nice story because they were dramatically depleted. They made their way back. Their numbers are building. 
Do we want another herbivore to compete against the moose and potentially cause the moose to decline? So there's a lot of things to be considered, but one of the biggest ones is that we really don't want to take any chances bringing chronic wasting disease into New York. So what that is, is it's, it's a disease very similar to mad cow disease, and it only affects cervids, which are deer, elk, moose, caribou. It's always lethal. We actually had it in New York briefly in 2005, where they found it in a few deer near a deer farm. We're one of the only states that have ever successfully eradicated it. That We jumped on it, we've done lots of monitoring, lots of testing, and we have every reason to believe that over that past almost 20 years, it has not showed up again. But it's in a lot of neighboring states, um, so there's really no safe way of being sure that we're not bringing it in if we try to bring elk in, because you cannot test an animal for it um, you know, reasonably while it's alive. So that wouldn't do any good. So we'll see what the future brings if chronic wasting disease goes away, but as of now, elk probably will not be brought back to New York. Wolf, right? This is probably an exciting one that people wanted to come to hear a little bit about. So we had plenty of wolves in New York State. They are still currently listed as an endangered species in New York. So if you see one, you know it's a wolf, you really can't harm it. They're protected. Obviously, if it's out right on top of you, there's some issue with your, your immediate health and safety, that changes the equation. But the chances of that are extremely low. So it's a protected species that you, know, you should probably leave alone if you see one, but you probably won't. So, and I'll tell that story. So mid-1800s, they were really just restricted to the mountainous parts of the state. Uh, again, the bounties, people didn't like them. Issues with livestock depredation, uh, just a, a fear of wolves. So they were actively you know, pursued and, and eradicated, basically. So by 1900, extirpated. So gone from New York. But there are currently populations not terribly far away. There's the Western Great Lakes population of wolves which is Minnesota, Wisconsin, and really the upper peninsula of Michigan. And then up here in Ontario, Canada, and generally centered around a place called Algonquin Provincial Park. They have wolves in both of those areas. There are, you know, inhospitable kind of terrain between us and them that make it unlikely that they're going to just move into New York, you know, with ease uh, anytime soon. Um, but it could happen because the story that I'm about to tell is of a wolf that was found in New York and was confirmed to be a real wolf. So in 2021, if you hadn't already heard about this, a uh, coyote hunter had shot what he thought was a coyote. Upon closer inspection, he was like, this is way too, too, way too big to be a coyote. And then taking a closer look at some of the different features like this, you know, images show, rounder ears, blockier snout, he thought it was a wolf. He contacted us at DEC, you know, we assessed it, took a look at it, and thought, well, he might be right. We sent off for genetic tests. The genetics came back saying, yeah, it's a Western Great Lakes genetic, you know, related to those wolves. And then so then the next layer of how we, you know, analyze that is, well, was it um, someone's illegal pet that they let go? Did somebody hijack it from there and bring it here as a prank? Um, or did it really come here on its own? So we had to look at a lot of different, you know, chemistry to it to, to decide, well, what was it eating? Um, we can look at that in the chemical makeup of like its bones and its hair to see what it was feeding on. Um, and and there, are there any sort of signs that it was domesticated? Is there, you know, tattoos or marks on it or anything like that? Long story short, we determine it's a wild wolf and it probably walked here all by itself, which is amazing. So it was a four-year-old male wolf, which is just the right age for a wolf to want to be wandering, looking for new terrain. And there's been studies of the wolves out in, in the Great Lakes area to see how far they'll walk. And they'll wander 2,000 miles, you know, not overnight, but in their general area. So it's totally reasonable that one walked from there to here. It's just crazy that it did. So it's possible. And in the past 25 years, we do have uh, three confirmed wolves in our general area. So that's just, I want you to keep that in mind because... It's not impossible, it has happened, but really, you know, most likely what you're seeing if you see anything is a coyote. And if you do see something that makes you think it might be a wolf, try to take a closer look. Take video, take photos, look at these features, the size of it, you know, the tracks, dramatically different. A coyote track is about three inches. 
A wolf track is five inches. So it's pretty big. Obviously, there's really big dogs out there, and their tracks look a lot similar. So really think about, well, what are the neighbor's dogs like, or you know, who might be bringing a dog out on this state land. It could be anything out there. But so this shows my hand next to a real wolf track in Montana. It's just massive. So really look for some of those details if you think you saw one. But the odds are three in 25 years, you probably won't see one. Similar story with the mountain lion, right? Still on the New York State endangered species list. So they are protected in New York State, even though you know, we haven't had one or any you know, real population here in quite a long time. You know, early 1900s, extirpated, so removed from New York. Last record in 1903, again, the bounties really, really pursued it. Uh, we have had sightings, right? So at DEC, we get phone calls from people regularly um, thinking they saw a mountain lion. Um, and by regularly, I mean at least our office in Avon a couple dozen times a year. So not like crazy, but that's you know, often enough. And we often try to talk them through it and be like, well, what did you see? What did it look like? Um, and usually without evidence, we don't do site visits and figure it out because oftentimes they'll, you know, doubt their, their confidence in it, and, and we tell them, well, next time, see what you can find. See if you find some hair, see if you find a track, and then we'll follow up on it. But so many times when they do show us what they think is evidence, like a photo, it turns out it's just mistaken identity. You know, it's, it's, it's a house cat or, um, you know, just something they got a bad look at. So, and sometimes they'll show us a video and they'll be convinced that, you know, my cousin Dave sent me this and he saw this. And then we'll go on Google and we'll look and we'll find the video from like Idaho six years earlier. I don't know how that happens, but sometimes it just goes like wildfire and people start sharing these photos or videos. But same conclusion as the wolf. Nothing is impossible. It really happened in 2011. One of DEC's um, environmental conservation officers, uh, if I got the story right, I think it was his wife, saw one out the window where they lived in Lake George and she told him and he's like, really? Hmm. They went and looked, they found some hair. Genetic analysis says, yeah, this is a mountain lion. A little while later, a roadkill mountain lion shows up in Connecticut. Do the test, same individual. And the story is shown here. So Connecticut, far right, that's where the roadkill happened. In New York, that's Lake George area. There's this trail of evidence to show exactly where it went or where it came from. So the genetics showed, yes, this is a mountain lion with the, the matching genetics of populations of mountain lions in South Dakota area. And then there's you know, these moments where different people saw a mountain lion where they're uncommon, right? In Wisconsin, you see a mountain lion, you'd be like, hey, you know, same deal, like, what the heck? Did I really see that? So there's fur collected here, trail cameras, all these different things to be like, yes, that's the same individual mountain lion. So it walked itself all the way through there and was hit by a car. So it can happen, but the odds are against it. Because if we had more of these, we would have a whole lot more evidence. We would have, there's probably a million trail cameras set up in New York State right now from hunters and other recreational, you know, people that just like think it's exciting to see what wildlife are out there. No one's giving us a photo that's really a mountain lion. So you would have that if we actually had a lot of these. Um, roadkill would be happening. We got evidence about one and it got hit by a car. So if there were a hundred, more would get hit by a car, right? So, so DEC's, you know, you know, best judgment on this is that the wanderer might occasionally happen, but we really don't have, uh, you know, a, a sustaining breeding population of mountain lions in New York. So if you think you saw one, you might have. I can't say you didn't, but think twice and think about what you might confuse it with, because this is an example. So this is a call we got um, last summer, and the caller was convinced that this was a mountain lion, and we tried to, you know, talk him through it, and a lot of us looked at the photo, and we were like, no, it's just, it's just too small. I see the resemblance, you know, sure, it's, it's a tan cat, it looks muscular, uh, but they were like, no, it's, it's, they thought it was big. They're like, no, it's way too big. So in some of those situations where folks just, you know, aren't convinced by what we have to tell them, and if they have something that we can actually work with, um, which is, this is nice, it's a trail camera in a set location with a path, we have a life size of an average size mountain lion wooden cutout that we bring to places to make a comparison so you could see the size difference. It's dramatically larger, right? This is only a couple days later, so like nothing changed with the corn or anything like that. It's the same trail cam. So 
you can really see it. So it's easy to make mistaken identity. That's the main thing. It's not impossible, but yes. It's just a house cat. Yep, just a large like tomcat house cat. Yep. Yep. So, and that's the mountain lion. So now the story that, you know, some might ask, will we ever bring these back? One, I want to just, you know, squash the rumors. We have not done this before. We've not brought wolves, we've not brought mountain lions into New York State. But there's been conversations about, well, would it ever be a good idea? And, you know, there's people that would be in supportive of that. And part of the reason for that would be that we'd restore some of that predator-prey dynamic that we disrupted by killing all the apex um, predators from the area. So we have too many deer, which we'll talk more about later. That could help reduce those numbers, reduce the issues with that, like the, the damage it causes to forest and habitats, or people are probably a little bit tired of constantly hitting them on the road. So it could help with that. Um, and it might bring, you know, ecotourism. People might want to come to New York to go camping and hiking if they think they might hear a wolf howl. You know, I mean, that's pretty cool. But the opponents have some pretty valid reasoning as well. You know, concerns with livestock depredation, sure, that would be, you know, difficult and have to be dealt with. Um, possible impacts to game species. So, you know, even though in some cases we do have a lot of deer, some, you know, people, it's important to them to be able to find them pretty easily. And so their recreational pursuits matter. Um, and then potential for attacks on people. I understand why, you know, somebody would be like, it's a predator. Why would we bring that back? It's scary. But millions of people live in, you know, pretty you know, safe conditions with mountain lions out in the western U.S. Very, very rare for there to be attacks. So that, that's not too, too much of a realistic issue, but the fear is understood. So we've done social surveys with the public to really feel their, their concept and their ability about, or their you know, concerns about it. And ultimately, support's very limited for us to do it on purpose to actively bring them back. But there is some support for just letting it naturally happen. So DEC's intentions and our stances that with our management of, of the landscape and you know, trying to um, you know, encourage people to manage their land in a healthy way to, to foster a, a landscape that's connected with habitats and, and provides you know, healthy areas that wildlife can prosper and it might bring them in. If it happens, great. If it doesn't, you know, that's, that's not that bad. So I put coyote last in this species breakdown because coyote are actually not native to New York. Yeah, it's uh, a Western species and it just moved in when the wolves were gone. There was this void, this vacancy of, you know, a place where they can be successful. So they slowly moved in and they moved in from Canada. So from the West up into Canada and then down into Northern New York in the Adirondacks area. So 1920, they first showed up in New York. By the late 30s, they were pretty established up, up North Franklin County by the 50s all over the Adirondacks, starting to branch out into different parts of the state. By the 80s, really everywhere except New York City and Long Island, but they still made it there. 2009, they made it to Long Island. And so since they made that trek, they, they, brought, they got themselves here. Moving through that part of Canada, some of the history, uh, wolves were still in low numbers in that part of the you know, North America at the time. So there was some interbreeding that happened between the Western coyote when it moved through there and got here, and even some um, breeding with domestic dogs, which really doesn't happen often. But the genetics of the Eastern coyote, which is the same species, but a little different, is 64% Western coyote, approximately, you know, 26% wolf and 10% domestic dog. So the coyotes we have here do have a little bit of wolf in them, but they are still very much coyotes. You know, they look and act just like Western coyotes, they're just a little bit bigger. So that's, that's genetically what they're composed of. But it's not all, you know, good situations. Uh, I mentioned the dramatic change. Forest declined, um, populations of wildlife crashed, some of them rebounded. We have 63% forest now, that's a great thing but there's a lot of things that are declining still. So there's some birds listed here, um, and in red is what the percent of their populations have done since 1970. We have great data on birds since 1970. Three billion birds have disappeared since 1970. Uh, these species here are birds that we have in this part of New York that breed here, and it, you know, it's pretty important habitat for them. 
Cerulean Warbler is down 73%. Black-billed Cuckoo, 66%. That's really concerning. And then down here, insects. Just broad research, different categories of, of insects and different locations, a range of 45 to 76% decline just across the board of different insects. It's really bad since insects are an important food source for a lot of wildlife. And then native plants are down 25%. Uh, this is the Northeast specifically. So these are really concerning things. Um, we've got a lot of work to do. And, and that's what I really like about my job is that I look at these things and, and it, it, it bothers me. And a lot of my work is trying to fix conditions on the ground to make it better for these species. So the next bit, which is you know, just the next like 10 to 15 minutes, is to talk a little bit more about what, what we're facing today. Um, what the threats are affecting our, our forest habitats and then a little bit about what we can do about it. So the biggest number one problem is habitat loss and fragmentation. So you know, the, just the biggest thing is you take it from, from functional habitat and turn it into something not usable. So forest gets turned into your house or something like that. That's loss. And fragmentation is chopping it into little pieces because certain wildlife species really need to have big tracts of a certain habitat to be successful. So just an example of, of how we do it, that was all forest, um, and it's been, you know, broken up by roads and houses. Uh, probably an awesome place to have your backyard, but not awesome for wildlife. So if we can make choices that avoid this, that will be the best, you know, to benefit wildlife. And there's a lot of these pests and diseases that we're dealing with. And these, you know, are some of the, the real challenges that I deal with at work each day to try and, you know, think about how can I improve forest habitat or make it better when these are constantly just popping up and getting in our way. So the emerald ash borer, if you haven't heard of it before, it's a non-native invasive insect. Uh, first showed up in New York in 2009 and has quickly, you know, really destroyed the ash uh, that we have. Uh, everything that we have in this area in Canandaigua now, you know, with ash are dead or dying. You know, we still have some little ones that are still alive. We'll see what happens to those in the future in time, but it's a real, real terrible situation. And we've got thousands of acres of forest that we're calling aftermath forest because they had a lot of ash. You know, depending on that history of the forest, when it was abandoned from a field or whatever, a lot of forest had a lot of ash in it. So all those dying, the concern is, What's going to replace them? In a lot of cases, there's not a lot of trees already growing beneath them. There's not, you know, the right kind of trees to think that, you know, it's going to make a productive forest. There's a lot of invasive plants in a lot of cases that are getting in the way and stopping trees from growing. So that's a big worry. And, and you know, some of the work I do on our state lands is to actively make sure trees grow to replace these. There's the hemlock woolly adelgid. So that's an issue. Uh, we've got those hemlocks in the gullies around Canandaigua Lake and in the watershed. Really fantastic for keeping you know, water quality cool, um, nice year-round cover for wildlife. First found in New York State in 1985. Really this area, the watershed, it's, it's here, it's widespread. Our property, high tour wildlife management area down near Naples, we're seeing lots of hemlock trees dying or dead already. Uh, it's really concerning. We're currently trying to treat a bunch of them to keep some of them alive and working with Cornell University to release biological controls that are predators that will eat this insect. Time will tell how it all shakes out in the end. Uh, but so yeah, over the course of, you know, five to 10 years, it'll kill hemlock trees. It all depends on, on the conditions. And the last little example of these real worrisome pests and diseases is oak wilt. So you may have heard of this before, maybe not. It's a fungus. It is not really widespread throughout New York State, which is good for most of the state, but we have it here. It's been found in the town of Canandaigua, Middlesex, South Bristol, all for the past, over the past, you know, six or seven years when it first popped up. And, you know, a lot of work's gone into trying to eradicate it in those individual locations. Uh, but, so it, a red oak, it'll kill in like a couple months, really fast, absolutely insane. A white oak might take a couple years, but still lethal. So if you see your oak leaves turning brown like that in the middle of the summer, call DEC. We're gonna want someone to come and take a look at it and we're gonna hopefully be able to um, contain it. Not save those trees, but contain it. So ways that you can, you know, at least prevent its spread. Uh, one of the main ways it spreads is a beetle 
that feeds on the fungus fruit will take its spo the spores and it's also attracted to wounds on oak trees. So it will go to those wounds and then spread the spores of the fungus. So if you've got oak trees in your yard and you want to prune some of the limbs, wait until it's cold. Wait till it's winter time when beetles and other insects are not moving. That's your best bet. If you have an oak forest and you want to do a logging project, again, wait till it's cold. So all the invasive plants, these are a real problem um, and they're definitely going to have some issues with future forests, but these are four that are pretty common in our area. So just to point out, if you haven't heard of them before, swallowwort is a perennial vine, grows maybe this tall. Um, autumn olive is a small bush, has like red berries and kind of a silvery uh, kind of shine to its leaves. Buckthorn, dark green leaves, dark black berries, and honeysuckle with the bright red berries. These are a real problem. They're everywhere. You know, a lot of them were planted on purpose and then took over. So, you know, it's a shame that we accidentally did that in the past. But why they're bad for habitat, and that means they're bad for wildlife, is they compete and or outcompete native plants and push them out. So they get denser and denser, and what might have been a nice, you know, community of, of multiple species of plants then turns into just a few. Um, and that's not good for a lot of reasons. Uh, and an issue with that is that these invasives don't support as many insects. Insects, again, are a very important food source for wildlife. Birds feed on insects heavily when they're breeding and nesting. A lot of studies have gone to look that, you know, these are not from our area. A lot of different insects in the area haven't evolved to feed on these plants. So there's just way less insects on these. So an area overrun with these is going to have less birds and other wildlife. And then the berries, there's been research to show that these have pretty low value for wildlife as well, that they're more high sugar uh, and they're lower in fat and calories. And when you've got, you know, late summer, fall, a lot of birds trying to migrate hundreds of miles and they're just stopping to refuel, they're not getting what they need from these. You know, it's not going to give them the energy they need. Deer, like I mentioned a few times, these are uh, overabundant deer are a problem in certain areas. You know, it's not everywhere. You know, it's not a disaster. Uh, in some places it's worse than others. In some places they're not that bad. Uh, but there are some areas where this is definitely a concern. Uh, part of the issue is that, you know, deer eat. Uh, a, lot of the, a lot of times of the year they're, they're browsing on plants. And they have preferred so plants that they like to eat and ones that they don't like to eat. So they leave behind all these ones that they don't like to eat. Uh, and that really is an issue because, like I said, we need to know what the trees are growing that might replace the forest when the canopy trees die. So this example here is a fenced-in area where they kept the deer out, filled with nice young trees and shrubs. And this area has none of that, but it's a whole bunch of invasive grass. So the invasive grass is able to take over if the deer eat everything that's good. And then on the other side, this example, the understory has nothing green except this dark green, which is barberry, which is an invasive bush. And deer don't like to eat that. Wildlife don't like to use it. If all those trees died, it would just turn into a thicket of barberry. So that's a problem. And then also the fact that the deer are eating all the other good stuff that probably starts to grow, tries to grow, and then doesn't get anywhere. A lot of different, you know, wildlife need to have cover. They need to have places to hide in the forest. Um, a lot of birds nest on the ground or they nest, you know, at head height. They need to have, you know, a variety of sizes of trees and shrubs to really make them do well. So too many deer, you might just think I'm talking about it's harming trees, it's harming birds, it's harming insects. It's really a cascading problem of habitat in general and it's affecting a lot of species. It's not just about, you know, the deer and the plants they're eating. So this situation, what we can do to help a little bit is, you know, I recommend if people own property, you know, if you're not a hunter yourself, I, I recommend you think about letting other people hunt on your land. If you are a hunter, you know, thank you. I encourage you to take more. Um, consider taking, you know, hunting more does to limit their reproductive ability. And, and if this is anything that you're open to, if you haven't let anyone hunt your property before, up at the top corner there that says ask, that's a sticker. I have a bunch of those here that you could just put on your posted sign to let anybody know that you're, you might be open to it and they can find a way to get a hold of you and you can have a conversation. You have control over what people do when they come, uh, but it can make a difference. So a little bit more about what you can do and then I'll be all done here. 
So if you own a forest, there's a lot you can do to just make it more healthy and better habitat, right? So you know, think about what your forest looks like right now and see if you can improve it by creating more diversity. Um, and mainly that means you want to have multiple species in the understory and in the canopy. If you've got one species and something comes and damages that, a pest or a disease, what are you left with? You're left with whatever's down here. So you want what's down here to also be diverse. Uh, and you want it to be native species. You don't want it to be the invasives. You want it to be unfragmented if you can. If you're thinking about building a house or a cabin somewhere, think about how you can situate it to cause the least fragmentation. And this all will create resilience that if you check these boxes, your forest will be able to you know, withstand issues like those pests and diseases, climate changing and all that. How will different tree species react to that? The more diversity you have, the better it will be able to adapt to that. Um, and you want it to look like this. You want it to look thick and lush because that provides the structure that a lot of wildlife need to be at different layers, up and down, food, hiding places, all that. So for you to be able to do that, if you do happen to own enough forest to kind of make some, some changes to, DEC has foresters called stewardship foresters that specifically work with private landowners. They can come to your property, do a little site visit, and they'll write you a free plan that says, you know, I think this forest could use this change and this change. Um, and that can really open your doors to get financial um, assistance that can help pay for different projects from the state or the federal government. And then there's also potential tax benefits if you have you know, the, the right size forest with the right potential management ability. So yeah, there's a contact here. Um, you know, I see some folks taking photos, great. Otherwise, you know, I've got cards here. Um, you can contact me, I'll make sure you get you know, put in contact with the right person. DEC has this list of cooperating foresters. And basically these are you know, private individuals that are foresters that you know, we've vetted to know that they're going to do um, you know, sustainable work that's going to create healthy forests and going to make you know, good healthy habitat for wildlife. So you could just find this by going to our website and searching find a cooperating forester and they will charge a fee, but they'll most likely get you more value and revenue for the trees you're selling. And they'll also you know, create um, you know, a resource that's worth more in the long term. And so future value. Uh, and logging can absolutely be good for wildlife habitat because it can manipulate it and create you know, the regrowth that you might want or the structure that is best for certain wildlife. And so you know, if you can recognize what some of these invasive plants are, you can try and do something about it yourself. You know, maybe you're looking for a hobby and you want something to do. You know, this can be pretty rewarding. I do, I do this at work and I do it on my free time sometimes because I like to see the change. I like to look at the area and be like, I you know, have you know, cleaned that up. There's a lot of natives now and I got rid of the bad ones. And then I can see the cool plants that grow and, and the cool uh, insects and birds that show up. So it's fun, but you know, there's herbicide you can use to kill, kill things. You can pick or pull the seeds. You can use a shovel to dig them out. If they're young, you can pull them right out of the ground. We recommend people clean their shoes before you go hiking and afterwards because you don't want to, you know, you might have a piece of mud stuck on your, your boot that has a seed in it. So you're not bringing seeds to a new site. And, and even some of our properties, you know, state land, we've got areas that are bad and, and pretty overrun with invasives. Uh, we try to work on it, but it's hard. So you don't want to take seeds from your hike and take them elsewhere back home or to other parks. And you can treat some of your trees. This is a coworker treating a hemlock tree um, to try and keep them alive you know, with the pressure of all these threats we face. So last slide, whether you own just a, you know, half acre or, you know, 10 acres or something, there's a lot that, you know, any of us can do to make a difference. And that's with your yard that you can create habitat. You know, if you can mow less, if, if you, you know, think about it and you're like, you know what, that quarter acre over there, or that half acre, I never go over there. I never hang out. I never play. Why not just let it go to habitat, right? Discontinue your mowing, see what's growing, and even if it's just you know overgrown grass meadow, that's still good for something. In your landscaping, transition away from the traditional exotic plants. They, like I've mentioned, you know, like the invasives, don't support insects, and that's you know causes a trouble with wildlife not finding food there. Uh, you really want to be able to have natives that our wildlife have adapted to, to coexist, live on, nest on. So I've been doing this a lot at my property that I moved in with my wife 
like seven years ago. I've ripped out all the barberry, replaced it with blueberries. I ripped out a Japanese maple and put a service berry there, planted elderberry, flowering dogwoods. And the next big thing on my list is to get rid of all the burning bush. I can't wait. That's happening this fall. So, you know, there's a lot you can do. But just, you know, plant anything you can, you know, in your an area that you are mowing, you can still mow it if you want, but then just plant some more trees or some, some bushes, turn part of it into a pollinator meadow. If you're going to wipe things out and replant it, I highly recommend you really look at your seed source to make sure that they're native plants and not something like that has, you know, California poppy or something like that. You really want things that are from the area. Um, and you can create brush piles and log piles that maybe you've got dead ash trees that you're worried about. You can cut it down, pile it up, and that's great wildlife habitat. You know, I mean, if you want to burn it for firewood, great, but if you don't, let it just rot. It's great habitat. And then some of these that I listed up here are just good ones to think about that, you know, if you discontinued mowing an area, you might see some of these just pop up on their own. Hawthorn is a nice shrub or small tree. It's got huge, pretty gnarly looking thorns, inch and a half, two inches long. Great, great wildlife plant. Dogwood, there's gray dogwood and silky dogwood. Really pretty abundant um, in Ontario County. Will probably bounce or pop up real quick. And, and that's a super food for birds. They love those berries. Um, and if you see invasives coming in at that same time, when they're young, it's really easy to pull them out. So you could really you know, put something on a good track without too much effort. And then I need to really promote oak. There's been a lot of research to show that oak is just a super, super plant. It's host to way more you know, insect diversity than a lot of other plants. Um, so that's huge amount of food for wildlife and, and just, just the way that oaks grow, a lot of wildlife spend time living on them. So love oak, but anything native will be a win. So that's it, that's all I got for you. I, I hope that you found some of that entertaining, you learned something that you didn't already know, and I hope you're inspired in some way to, to make some small changes, because if everybody changed a little bit of, of their landscaping in their yard, you know, we might have a million more acres of habitat. Um, and what I really want is like 100 years from now, somebody giving a talk just like this, they can talk about the challenges we're facing right now and have you know, a positive story to tell us that we found the solutions and that we did it. Mm -hmm.